In a world where brands like Supreme and Rolex create artificial scarcity, I'm looking for true luxury, artisanship. My name is Salvatore Ambrosino. My friends call me Salva. I believe in the future of craftsmanship and luxury, and I'm the founder of L'Arte Nascosta. My first word as a baby was not mom, was not dad. It was clock. So it was my parents' first wedding anniversary, and uh, my mom gave my dad a long case grandfather clock. The clock ran a little bit fast, and my dad, being who he is, became a horologist to fix it. My basement was transformed into a uh, clockmaker's workshop. Before 10 years went by, my parents were collecting antique clocks. As a kid, I was obsessed with everything military. Inspired by a TV show, it was called Tour of Duty. And it was like this whole drama series about the Vietnam War, and there was one character in particular that wore a Hamilton H3 uh, in the series, and I thought that was the coolest watch. And I wanted one. I asked for one for Christmas, and my parents got me this, uh, which is just a very simple field watch, um, private label made by who knows who for Cabela's. And I actually wore it until it stopped working, the mechanism wore out. I always wear a watch because of this. So it was a gateway to viewing a watch as, as, a, as a time capsule, you know, something that is your own personal uh, collector of memories. I think of taking the uh, high school entrance exam, I think of taking the college entrance exam, um, I think of countless uh, trips to Italy. So it was something that made me feel part of Saving Private Ryan. It made me feel like I could have some sort of connection to the, like, the great American heroes, you know? I grew up with this watch, and to me it's really a symbol of the uh, emotional factor that a uh, timepiece can have. Beyond this watch, which I just loved because of what it represented and because I wore, it was my watch, I wore it every day, um, I got into menswear. As my kind of sensibilities towards, uh, towards taste and tailoring uh, became more uh, cultivated and a little more refined, um, I kind of began to expand into the world of horology because if you have a nice suit, then the nice suit is made even better by the nice watch and then the nice shoes and it just becomes a kind of a whole world. My next two watches were literally untouched since the quartz crisis until they came tumbling out of a drawer. But I had no idea what they were. I just had no conception of what Omega was. It was just a brand like any other. In the 70s, my, my grandfather gave them to my dad and my dad just kind of wore them straight through until the quartz crisis hit and my dad got his first quartz watch and he's just kind of, they've been sitting in a drawer since then. They're a Omega Constellation pan dial. And the other watch is a Seamaster DeVille, uh, which I found out is an interesting piece. This dates from around mid 60s, probably 65, 66 or so. And it's an interesting timepiece that happens that you know Omega comes up with at the time of an intersection between dress watches and sports watches. Um, because after this point, the Seamaster became its own very sports watch, dive watch thing, and the DeVille became its very own independent dress watch thing. They have very different personalities. They wear very differently. Um, the first thing that hits me uh, when I look at the, uh, the design of the watches um, is the difference in the bezels. Um, this bezel is, I don't know, two millimeters, two millimeters deep. It gives you kind of like a smaller dial uh, and ironically, it wears smaller, than, in my perception, uh, than the Seamaster does, which has a much smaller bezel, a much larger dial, uh, and so it wears kind of flatter, uh, takes up, same device, they're both 36 millimeters, but the impression is that it wears larger on the wrist. My dad gravitated towards the Seamaster, um, and as a matter of fact, if you look really closely, there's all the little signs that he wore the hell out of this watch, um, even though it is in incredible condition. Um, and I've been wearing a lot of the Constellation just because that three-dimensional design language, the pan dial, you know, the, uh, the beveled uh, circumference of the, uh, of the pan dial really to me um, just makes it that much more visually complex uh, and more exciting to wear. So I got these two watches. I kind of, at that point, I was like, wow, this isn't just something that we found in my dad's chest of drawers. This is like a whole world. So I began reading up on the vintage world. Um, and I began learning more about Omega's history. And so I was really attracted to the Speedmaster. Beginning a career, you know, in the workforce, 
I wanted something to commemorate that. My dad took uh, off from uh, work one day, met me here in Midtown, and we uh, walked into the Omega Boutique. I was not in the position to be buying a luxury watch. The uh, sales associate took out the Moon Phase uh, edition, which I loved for many personal reasons. So it's got the design language of the Speedmaster. It has that black dial with the white applications that I really love. Um, and most, the first thing that hit me is that I loved the proportions of the four subdials on the on the uh, on the dial, and then turning it over to see the actual uh, the wor inner workings of the mechanism, uh, being the son of a horologist and seeing how the whole thing the whole thing works was incredible to me. The moon phase is looked at in modern the modern world as the most useless complication, uh, but they are so 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 wrong, especially on an Omega. So in my dad's antique clock collection. He just kind of loved the idea of a moon phase complication. What that meant historically from a mechanical perspective to actually develop the technology to accurately uh, account for the, the changing in the phases of the moon. Um, to actually the reason why it was used, whether you know, to organize uh, planting seasons or whether you know, in the days before street lamps, deciding, determining whether or not you could travel at night you would look, you would travel by full moon. If it was a new moon, you probably wouldn't travel because there wouldn't be any light to travel by. Um, so when you collect an antique timepiece that has such a technological innovation feature on it, it really brings you into the past. And just as you know, the moon phase complication on my dad's clocks connects him to the past, moon phase complication on this watch connected me to my dad. And as I was getting deeper into horology, I was getting deeper into understanding clothing, more specifically Neapolitan school of sartorial menswear. So it was like super niche, super specific. What certainly started as kind of a, uh, a superficial appreciation for the aesthetic of, you know, a certain way of dressing, uh, quickly evolved into a much deeper uh, appreciation for the craftsmanship that goes into making it. I was studying for a master's degree in Renaissance history um, at NYU's campus in Florence. I get lost on my way to school. I had no idea where I was. Now in retrospect, I was just around the corner from the Duomo, which is kind of funny, but I thought I was like deep into Florence. And uh, I hear this noise that right away brought me back to my dad's workshop. And it was hammering metal. And I look inside and there's this really dimly lit, very characteristic workshop. And there's this guy kind of like hunched over a workbench, hammering at a piece of jewelry. I knocked on the door, introduced myself, said, hey, I'm a, just an NYU student studying Renaissance history. You just saw what you're doing. Tell me about it. And that just started kind of uh, a friendship with this uh, wonderful family of artisans, uh, goldsmiths in Florence that are specialized in making things according to the Florentine Renaissance tradition. In Italy, there's a culture of actual, real, hard, concrete, work. Real work. There's loads and loads of just one-man companies all throughout Italy that carry on a cultural patrimony because every morning they wake up, they sit down at their desk, and they make something according to a tradition that they've inherited and they've um, uh, dedicated their lives to perfecting. Because of market pressure, artisanal workshops are disappearing. And the saddest part of the whole formula is that the shops aren't disappearing because of a lack of demand. They're disappearing because of an information gap. So l'arte nascosta means the, uh, the hidden art in Italian. And I guess you could say it's my journey of discovery of Italian artisanship that I share uh, with, the, uh, with the public, with whoever's interested in reading about it. In addition to you know, closing the information gap between uh, Italian artisans and American patrons. My vision for this project is to be the conduit that connects a uh, patron in the United States to an artisan's workshop in Italy and help facilitate that entire process from beginning to end, whether it's designing a one-of-a-kind piece of jewelry to uh, actually receiving the product in hand. What I think artisanal commissions offer is an alternative to all that very uh, anxiety, that very anxious world, that very uh, nervous, uh, nervously motivated, uh, covetous materialism. Let's put it that way. 
And it's an alternative to that because it gives you the option to make something that means something very specific and very profound to you. Here's an example. Our first product category is, uh, is signet rings. A customer said to me, uh, you know, I want something that expresses my love for my, for my wife to be. Uh, I'm not sure what that symbol could be. So we looked into art history and we pulled out a painting called Mars and Venus by Botticelli. And we did some research on this painting and narrowed down the composition to one feature at the focal point of the painting, which is a satyr that carries away Mars's lance while he's in a slumber and Venus kind of overlooks the entire scene in a position of power. And one of her little satyrs is disarming him. And this is an allegory for the disarming power of love. And what we were able to do is transition that meaning that, uh, that comes from history onto just a little signet ring for something that has personal, a tremendous personal significance for this, uh, for this patron that he's gonna be wearing for many years to come. And that to me is the spirit of artisanship in its purest form. Artisans can make sculptures at the level of the David. They can make mosaics at the level of something you'll find in Pape. They can't really tell a story. And that's what I do. I spend time with them. I learn about their process. But most of all, I learn about their philosophy. My task as a photographer is to capture that spirit through my lens.